So we're now going to move on to looking at modelling the lift force, otherwise known as the normal force or the force in the ZS direction. And again, we start with how we defined our stability axis system. So recall again the figure that I showed on the slides. You'll see that our lift force acts parallel to the ZS direction and we call this the lift vector associated with the trim condition, so it has a subscript 1 and we call that the aerodynamic force in the z direction in the zs direction associated with the trim condition one so again we start with that that definition and again recall that we can write the lift force as the lift coefficient obviously associated with the, the trim condition two multiplied by the dynamic pressure multiplied by the wing reference area and again, at a particular flight condition, namely a Mac and Reynolds number, the lift coefficient is a function of angle of attack, uh, elevated deflection angle, and the inclination angle of the horizontal tail. So very similar to how we formulated the drag coefficient. And again, we apply a Taylor series expansion to CL1, and also um, apply our reference condition, this one here, right, to write our um, drag coefficient, uh, sorry, our lift coefficient associated with the trim condition as this expression here. So again, these subscripts here mean derivative with respect to, right? So these are all lift um, stability derivatives lift stability derivative with respect to angle of attack, with respect to the elevated deflection angle, and with respect to inclination angle of the horizontal tail. So, so far, that formulation is the same as how we formulated the drag coefficient. But the next thing we need to do when considering the lift force is consider the different components which contribute to the overall lift of the aircraft. So we have a lift coefficient associated with the wing, a lift coefficient associated with the body, or the fuselage of the aircraft, right, and a horizontal uh, tail lift force contributor. Um, and it's traditional to uh, combine the lift contribution of the wing and the body together, um, generally because the body doesn't produce um, produces a very small amount of lift compared to that from the wings. So if we consider the lift contribution from the wing and body combined, we can write that in the same way as we wrote the lift force over here, look. We can write that as the lift coefficient associated with the wing and body multiplied by the dynamic pressure multiplied by the wing reference area. And we have a similar expression here then for the lift coefficient associated with the horizontal tail. This time the lift coefficient has um, subscript H. Now we have a different Q bar because the dynamic pressure is affected by downwash, remember. So Q bar and Q bar sub H are not going to be the same. And we also have a different reference area, right? So now we consider just the, the area of the tail. So, if we put those two expressions together into this equation up here, we can write the lift coefficient, the lift force associated with the trim condition as this expression here. And this is what we said the lift force was back over here, right? So we have this expression here, if we look at the right hand side of this expression, we can just divide through by Q bar S. So do, divide these two terms by Q bar S to get an expression for CL1. So we just get the lift coefficient associated with the wing and body plus the lift coefficient associated with the horizontal tail multiplied by the ratio of dynamic pressures. So the one that's affected by downwash divided by the free stream one. We call that 
eta sub h for the ratio of dynamic pressures, and then we have also have the ratio of reference areas, so the reference area of the horizontal tail divided by the reference area of the wing. And what we're going to do from this point is deal with these two coefficients separately and then put them back together in a moment. So firstly let's start with the term CL wing body, right, which we called term 1 in this equation here. Um, so we know that the lift coefficient of the wing and body is just a function of the angle of attack, right? So we have a very simple Taylor series expansion to apply this time. We just get these two terms. So this is the lift coefficient um, derivative with respect to angle of attack associated with the wing and body. We apply our um, reference condition, so at alpha 0 equals 0, and we're left with this. So we have the lift coefficient of the wing and body combined at the trim condition, so that's why it's got a zero associated with it, plus the lift stability uh, derivative of the wing and body combined with respect to angle of attack, because it's just a function of angle of attack, right? Multiplied by angle of attack. So, okay, so now what we need to discuss is um, a couple of little um, assumptions or approximations that we can make to this equation to reduce it down still further, namely that if the ratio of the wingspan to fuselage width is greater than 4, so remember the wingspan is given the letter B and the fuselage width is given the letter D, so if that is greater than 4, so that should be a 4 there, not 0, I'll adjust the notes, then the lift coefficient uh, derivative with respect to angle of attack of the wing and body can be approximated just on the lift coefficient of the wing um, due to angle of attack only. So basically we're just assuming that the fuselage doesn't produce much lift compared to the wings or a negligible amount of lift compared to the wings, which is generally true for most applications. So we can reduce that equation that we just had up here down to this thing where we have introduced a new coefficient k subscript wb where we have this kwb um, parameter based on the ratio of wingspan to fuselage width and it can be shown that for most subsonic uh, flight conditions that this parameter k subscript wb is approximately equal to 1. And there is a um, there's a table, or I should say a chart, in the textbook on page 84, so this is figure 3.6, which gives us typical values for the parameter k. And you can see that um, for uh, ratios of fuselage width to wingspan in this region here, um, so where that ratio is, is greater than 4, as I just described, right? Then this can be approximated to be 1. Okay? So that's the first uh, assumption that we make. And that deals with the first term of this equation. Now let's move on to look at the second term here, which is the lift coefficient associated with the horizontal tail. Well, this time... The lift coefficient associated with the, the horizontal tail is not only a function of the angle of attack of the horizontal tail, but we have to consider the inclination angle of the elevator and also the horizontal tail, tail itself if we have the case of a stabilator, right, a, a fully moving tail. So again, we apply a Taylor series expansion. This time we have more terms and we have, um, again, a couple of, of uh, assumptions which can reduce this equation down. So let's start over here. CL0 subscript H is the lift coefficient of the horizontal tail when angle of attack is zero. So normally control surfaces are symmetric. So, um, so think about not only elevators but rudders 
Um, they are typically symmetric so that it's um, intuitive for the pilot, right? To, to have similar forces in, 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 the, in opposite directions, right? Um, so therefore we can assume that this term is zero. Uh, because the lift coefficient of a symmetric aerofoil when the angle of attack of that aerofoil is zero, is zero, right? Next, let's look at the, uh, the, the uh, elevator deflection angle, delta sub E. Well, recall in a previous chapter, we looked at the change in angle of attack and said that was the product of the elevator deflection angle and this uh, tau sub e term, which is the control surface effectiveness uh, parameter, this, this in this case associated with the uh, elevator. So therefore we can just write this term, which is the lift coefficient associated with the horizontal tail with respect to the uh, elevator angle as just this, right? So what happens when we change the angle of attack um, of the horizontal tail multiplied by the effectiveness factor? And then finally, uh, we have the inclination angle of the horizontal tail. Um, but IH, the inclination angle of the horizontal tail, is the angle, ang angle of attack of the horizontal tail in the stability axis because that's how we've orientated our new axis system, so therefore we can just replace the lift coefficient um, uh, with respect to the inclination angle of the horizontal tail as just the lift coefficient um, associated with change in angle of attack. So you can see here what we've done is re we've removed that term We've replaced this term with an expression involving CL alpha H, and we've um, replaced this term with another uh, term which includes CL alpha H. So then we can write that expression if we factorize out the CL alpha H's as this thing. So one final little bit of manipulation to do with that equation there is to recall that the angle of attack on the horizontal tail is the angle of attack of the free stream uh, minus any downwash effects. So epsilon is our downwash angle, which is a, a function of angle of attack, right? So again, applying yet another uh, Taylor series expansion, we can uh, write and down an expression for epsilon. So I'm just going to have a sip of my Arizona iced tea, raspberry flavor. It's a good one. Need a bit of sugar and caffeine this morning. So where were we? Epsilon. So Taylor series expansion in epsilon evaluated at a um, a trim condition, and we assume um, we assume that the downwash angle at zero degrees is zero. So therefore, we have this expression for epsilon, and therefore replacing this term for epsilon into this equation, we have alpha h is equal to the free stream angle of attack minus this term for epsilon, which we factorize out to be this. And therefore, we have we have an expression for uh, Cl H, right? We have a an expression for Cl wing body, which we found up there. And the the final thing that we need to do before we put all of that stuff together is to replace our angle of attack associated with the horizontal tail in here. This is what I've written up here, okay? So this equation is just this equation, but with our alpha h replaced. And therefore, this is our expression for the, our final expression for that parameter number two that we had up here, right?
So now we can replace those two terms with those two new expressions that we found for 1 and 2 to get this mess. But what we have in this mess here is individual terms which correspond to our initial definition. So if we compare this equation here, CL1, to this equation here for CL1, we can see what, can you see that? You can see what some of these terms correspond to. So what we can actually do is separate these out and consider them separately. So first of all, let me move this a little bit closer. So what we have here, look, if we compare this equation for CL1 with, uh, where's it gone, this one, CL0 subscript wing body is just going to be our CL0, so that's what I've written here. CL0, uh, CL alpha W is going to be the term multiplying the angle of attack, so that's the CL alpha, right? But I've also got a term in here multiplying alpha, um, so CL alpha H multiplied by this 1 minus D epsilon by D alpha, also multiplied by this thing, right? So what I've done is I've just compared all the terms which are multiplied by alpha and therefore equated them to CL alpha and so on and so on to get these individual expressions right here. Um, one final thing to note about this is that the third equation can be used to simplify the fourth one because we find CLIH to be equal to this which also appears in this equation. So CL alpha H is here, look, eta H is there and that ratio is there. So this expression can be used to simplify that one into that. So that reduces our system down and, and means that we can consider those expressions individually. And it's seen for um, subsonic flight uh, conditions with general um, or typical values of the dynamic pressure ratio, the ratio of horizontal tail to um, wing reference areas, and for this term involving the change in downwash angle with respect to alpha, we see that the contribution of the lift coefficient associated with the horizontal tail is approximately 10 to 15% of the whole lift coefficient of the aircraft. And as I say, that's typical for most aircraft in most subsonic flight regimes.